Welcome to a brand new visual politic video. In order to get into this story, we've got to go back to 20th of January 2020, when the World Health Organization began to issue warnings about a new virus that, at that time, was already affecting its first cases in China. That same day, the cruise ship, Diamond Princess, owned by Princess Cruises, began what was to become a living hell for its 2,666 passengers and 1,045 crew members. At the same time, this colossal ship, 950 feet long, that's almost three soccer fields, began its voyage. The number of people infected by the coronavirus in China continued to increase. And when just a few days later, on 2nd of February, the Diamond Princess reached the coast of Japan, all alarm bells started ringing. A passenger who had left the cruise ship in Hong Kong a few days earlier had tested positive for COVID-19. In other words, the virus had probably been roaming around the ship for the entire duration of the voyage. So with this information, the Japanese government quarantined the cruise ship. None of the nearly 4,000 people on board were allowed to leave the ship barely two days after arriving in Japan. And with half the world watching the ship, the first positive cases began to be detected on board. In just one month, 712 of the 3,711 people on board had already been infected affected. The Diamond Princess was the first, but it was clearly not an isolated case. Gradually, new cruise ships were quarantined as the industry began to suspect the magnitude of the tsunami that was heading straight for them. And so began the worst year in history for the cruise industry. Listen up. The Year of the Collapse the numbers don't lie. To give you an idea, according to the Cruise Lines International Association, compared to the 29.7 million passengers registered in 2019, barely 400,000 were counted since the outbreak of the pandemic until the end of 2020. We're talking about a drop of more than 95% in world demand. In other words, the business collapsed as a result of quarantines, bans on cruises, and social fear. And don't forget that we're talking about a huge industry that during 2019, for example, employed more than 1 million people and generated activity of 150 billion US dollars. An industry, a sector that has some very extraordinary characteristics. As you can imagine, building and operating one of these ships is not cheap at all. We are talking about investments of hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars for each ship. For example, the Seashore, a MSC Cruises cruise ship with a capacity for 4,560 passengers and an investment of $1.1 billion is scheduled to be launched sometime in 2021. And in 2022, the Global Dream will arrive, whose budget exceeds $1.8 billion. And these are just two examples. This is the reason that companies in the sector have very high operating leverage as a hallmark. That is, they need a lot of capital investment and operate with very high fixed costs. And that is precisely what explains why, when they stop their operations, their losses multiply at full speed, almost exponentially. Which, by the way, is exactly what happened. Carnival, the world's largest cruise line, closed 2020 with losses in excess of $10 billion. In the same fashion, the other major listed companies in this sector, Royal Caribbean and Norwegian Cruise Line, recorded losses of $5.7 billion and $4 billion respectively, as you can see in this graph. In total, between the three companies, there were some $20 billion US dollars in losses in 2020 alone, compared to a combined profit of almost $6 billion US dollars in 2019. A situation that evidently had consequences. The three giants of the sector, Carnival, Royal Caribbean, and Norwegian Cruise Line, which together with MSC Cruises, account for more than 80% of the world cruise market, lost more than three quarters of their value in a stock market in just three weeks. We're talking about some 30 billion US dollars in market capitalization. What's more, since the fixed costs did not disappear and they did not know when they would be able to return to normal operations, these companies literally had to rush to the debt markets to obtain as much liquidity as they could get. For example, in the 12 months since the start of the pandemic alone, Carnival raised around $24 billion in the markets, mainly from bond sales. Thus, during 2020, this company became one of the largest issuers of junk bonds in the entire United States. Now the question that comes up is, for what? What did they raise that $24 billion for? Well, in short, to meet debt maturities, finance the more than $600 million it burns through every month, that operations have not been restored, and in order to have sufficient resources to survive if things take longer than expected to normalize. 
The fact is that now that its net debt has more than doubled from the $11 billion with which it closed 2019 to the more than $22 it has shown in the latest statement. And of course, don't think for a second it came cheap. The average rate Carnival paid was over 7.5 points above the LIBOR benchmark, which explains why its interest expenses went from about $200 million in 2019 to more than $1.2 billion in the 12 months between March 2020 and March 2021. And in the case of the rest of the companies in the sector, the situation is not much different. It is, so to speak, the underside of the enormous financial scar that COVID has caused for these companies. The pandemic put the brakes on a thriving industry that had managed to double its number of passengers over the last decade and expected to launch at least 19 more ships by 2020. An industry that nevertheless suddenly found itself shrouded in enormous uncertainty, immense multi-million dollar ships docked in ports, travel restrictions, the fear of contagion and the absence of a clear restart date. And take note, because the influence of this industry is greater than we might think at first glance. Let's take a look, for example, at the case of Spain. More than 10 million international travellers arrived to this country aboard these giant ships in 2018 and 2019. A very large number of travellers that has multiplied by 20 since 1992. And that obviously also has had a huge impact on many tourism businesses on land. For example, it is estimated that Spain alone suffered a loss of economic activity of more than 2.4 billion euros. So that's 2.9 billion dollars due to the collapse of the cruise industry during 2020. But let's not get sidetracked. The point is that the good progress of the vaccination process, the gradual return to our conventional life and economic reactivation have practically turned the situation around, at least in the stock market terms. However, what is the exact situation of the sector? What are the forecasts and what can we expect in the future? Well, listen up. A clear future? The worst seems to be over. And the good news is that despite everything, the major cruise lines seem to have managed to survive the coronavirus tsunami. And now demand is returning. For example, Carnival's bookings for 2022 are already at the high end of their historical trend. And the same is true for Royal Caribbean and Norwegian Cruise Line. In fact, a recent survey showed that three quarters of cruise tourists are eager to set sail again. In addition, the United States is by far the largest market in the world, accounting for more than half of all cruise tourism worldwide. In other words, the rapid recovery that the US economy seems to be experiencing, together with the relatively high levels of household savings over the last year and a half, could underpin the recovery of this industry. Whatever happens, the fact is that overall, the prospects look quite good. In fact, there are at least 100 vessels in the pipeline that are due to be launched over the next five years, and not a single order was canceled with the pandemic. Not a single one. And these positive expectations are behind the recovery of these companies' share prices on the stock market and the growing interest of fixed income investors in them. 26th of May, 2021. Carnival slashes interest costs with a $2.5 billion debt refinancing. The Financial Times. There was a time during 2020 when the market seemed to devalue these companies, even to the point of their demise. But now, with hindsight, it seems that we can say once again that the market's overreacted. Out of interest, on this occasion, for once, it seems that the Arabs got it right. The 6th of April, 2020. Saudi Arabia bought a huge stake in Carnival, Barron's. Now, wait a minute, because this doesn't mean that these companies do not face significant challenges and difficulties. As Morgan Stanley points out, a new spike in infections, for example, from a virus mutation could bring all these companies a world of pain. What's more, they are now highly leveraged companies with a lot of debt, more than $30 billion in the case of Carnival, 18.5 billion for Royal Caribbean, and just over $12 billion for Norwegian Cruise Line. In other words, their balance sheet is now much weaker, which implies greater risks. In addition, increasing environmental regulation seemed to point to the heavy investments in coming years. Investments that these companies will have to make while reducing their enormous debt load. The question is, will they be able to do it? Certainly, doing so could bring very good news for a sector that is still trading far from its pre-pandemic levels. But of course, today, the whole landscape of this industry has changed completely. The good news is that they have managed to pull through. 
Anyway, this is how the impact of the coronavirus, the pandemic, brought on the biggest crisis in the history of cruise ships. And now, if you have found this video that we've made in collaboration with our friends from Value School interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe to Visual Politic. All the best. See you next time.